the cockpit is not answering their phone. Our number one is in staff, and our five is in staff. I am going to call from Washington. I am in a situation where the American learned a possible hijack. What's going on, Betty? The crap is erratic again. Father, where are you ready?
everybody's doing okay and uh, today is uh, it's been a, an eventful day and uh, as you know it's uh, uh, Saturday 9-11 Memorial and uh, it's uh, you know I, I watched the uh, ceremony the, uh, you know the memorial services here in New York City and everything and uh, you know it's a bit sad and you know, what really was sad uh, to watch was the kids that were born after 9-11 who never knew the people who died uh, in those plane crashes and stuff, you know? Um, they, only, they only know them from the stories that their, uh, you know, their families have told, you know? And uh, I was like, you know, wow, that's, it really gets you thinking. And <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, you know, I just watching that, and you see some of these people, how much they've grown up in those 20 years. Some of them were just, you know, uh, kids in, you know, in the 10th anniversary. You know, they were still living at home with their parents, and now they've got kids of their own. <laughs> Time really moves on, you know. You know, for me, 9-11 was like yesterday, but, you know, 20 years goes by and, you know, a lot of stuff has happened. I mean, I consider the things that's happened to me in the last 20 years. I mean, I've lost both my parents. I lost my grandparents. Uh, I moved to uh, two different places uh, in that 20-year period, two different apartments. And... Uh, I bought two vehicles, <laughs> you know. Um, I met my girlfriend, you know, and uh, we're, you know, we're still together. And uh, I went through three cats, two cats. I'm sorry, two cats. Went through two cats. <laughs> um, <clears throat> When you start looking looking at it that way, when you start looking at the events, then you start to realize how much time's gone by, you know. And uh, it's like, wow, you know, 20 years, Jesus. You know, we, we really ought to re-emphasize more to to the youth growing up to make something of themselves in their life while they can, because that time is fleeting. You know, you just don't know how much time you have. You know, and the fact is, anything could happen to you, and like what happened to those people in those airplanes, and you'd, your life would be cut short. <clears throat> and that's not fair. You know, people often don't have uh, you know enough uh, respect for life. They take it so easily. You know. Um, but, you know, it kind of brings me to a point that I had a, a little conversation with a friend over uh, uh, online today. And we were talking about uh, uh, Star Trek and how Star Trek is portrayed today on television as opposed to how it used to be, you know, back in the 60s and, and the 80s. And uh, <clears throat> the generation today seems to have more of an appetite for the darker things, you know, for uh, for things not working out so well. And it's only because they've grown up in a time where they've watched our country simply fall apart from within, okay? And I'm just going to say, I'm going to take the last 20, 25 years and just say, okay, the, the kids that grew up in that period, they got to see a lot of negative things happen in this country in that in that period. Um, you know, they got to see this you know this forever war plan out in the Middle East, and they got to see 9/11. They got to see the economy collapse twice, I think. <laughs> um, they got to see uh, 
you know, bad leadership from our uh, elected officials and a lot of scandals uncovered in that time. Plus, you got to see rich people, a lot of rich people being uh, carted to Ford to uh, be to be punished for the crimes they committed. And you got to see the unrest of segments of our population as they're fighting racist attitudes and uh, uh, misogynistic attitudes and and uh, government trying to control women's bodies and you know what I'm saying we've got to see a lot of stuff I mean just think back all the all, think back to all the stuff in the last 25 years that's happened in the United States and you and think to yourself now if I was a baby and I grew up in that period what would my view of America be today would I have any hope that things would get better when it steadily got worse you know even when we got a, a president the country wanted uh, basically his impact as as a president has only been peripheral you know when I'm talking about President Obama <clears throat> um, I think at the end of the day, the only thing people are going to remember about him was he's the first uh, African American uh, uh, president that the country had. No one's really going to remember the things that he tried to do, except maybe for the healthcare thing, which a lot of people today say isn't really wasn't really worth it. You know, it just it ain't the thing we wanted. It was something else. So, you know, maybe that's all that he's going to be remembered for, and that's unfortunate because I know the guy who tried to do what he thought was right. And he was up against opposition every step of the way to just derail him. To try to make him a one-term president. All right? And these people that tried to do that, you know, may not have succeeded in making him a one-term president, but they did succeed in tarnishing, you know, a career that could have been something great for the country. So... When you have people growing up, kids growing up through that period, and they see things happen and then just simply get fizzled out, uh, after a while, you start to think the worst of things. You know, you start to see, well, that's not going to happen, and this is not going to happen, and that's not, you know what I'm saying? Uh, especially that time we, where so many young people were for Bernie Sanders, and they were trying to get him elected, and all of a sudden... Uh, some shenanigan took place and he gets kicked out, <laughs> got out of the friggin' race for the presidency. That really disheartened a lot of young voters at that time and a lot of young people who really thought the world of this guy, and they still do, but, you know, they got to see that, you know, there's always a bigger system at play to manip uh, manipulate uh, people's lives for the worse. And that we don't always get what we want. So, with that being, with all that being said, you know, this kid growing up in this world is going to have some very deflated attitudes about his own future or her own future. You know, they're not going to feel very hopeful. They're not going to feel very uh, uh, positive that things could change. But uh, I think. You know, that's that idea up to that point it would be how can I say it? it would be kind of a, a good analysis of things of today and why uh, people seem to have this uh, attraction to dystopian kind of entertainment. But I also think that this actually plays out even further than that because what Roddenberry was saying still applies even today. Okay, and his idea was that. Humanity will go through this period and come out the other end at a, as a different species of people will be different in their thinking. And it's only going to happen when humanity is confronted with a, a problem so big that it changes the world. Okay? And that could be anything from a, a World War III event to... Uh, maybe a near extinction level event that happens on this planet that brings people together to help each other to survive. And I think that the way things are now is actually a very mild, <laughs> you know,
you know, situation here because I don't think right now people feel the need to come together to help to survive. I think people come together only on, on certain issues, uh, but they don't all come together unified. What would bring people together to be unified is life itself, the, the threat that you're going, your life will end. And, and my, my source of thought on that comes all the way, goes all the way back to World War II. And after the, after the war had ended, the rest of Europe was devastated. You know, all the countries were devastated from the, uh, from Hitler and the Allied attacks and stuff, you know, during that whole war. I mean, there was so much damage and devastation. But during the rebuild of those countries, great things were enacted free health care, you know, uh, affordable colleges, uh, free colleges even. Uh, they had, you know, uh, uh, workers' rights enacted, okay? Something we tried to do in the United States, but it got shot down. I think, I can't remember what president it was. I think it was Roosevelt or somebody who was trying to enact a worker's bill of rights, which other countries have, but ours didn't, and he, he wanted to add that to the bill of rights, and it, nobody wanted it, I guess, or at least the certain segments of the government didn't want it. But in Europe, it, it worked. It, it passed, and they did it. And what you have, what, you, what they created was a more compassionate government, one that cares about its people. And since the United States was not devastated, at least on the mainland. I mean, yeah, they got hit in Hawaii, but the United States as a whole really went through that war uh, without having to rebuild its cities and all that shit because uh, we were just sending troops and equipment uh, into these countries and they were actually uh, on their ground fighting and bombing these, you know, their allies' areas and stuff, okay? So uh, we were spared that because the enemy hadn't come to the United States. It only, uh, we only had that one sneak attack in, at Pearl Harbor that was it okay it was it was a bad attack I'm not trying to belittle it okay it was bad but it mostly happened in the uh, dry docks and stuff like that where those areas could be repaired rather quickly um, the boats themselves were destroyed but you know that's not that's not really considered infrastructure in America that's just you know but in Europe I mean they there's it was just rubble over there. I mean, they, they had fought so long, they lost so much of their own histories and their own, uh, you know, the things that they, they, they uh, valued. They lost all that. And so those people had to come together for themselves and to save their countries. And that's, that's when they created, you know, they rebuilt Europe and they rebuilt all the all those areas and uh, you know memorials were set up and everything so things were, were, were able to get fixed at that point and it created great uh, great policies and, and, and different ways of looking at things we were spared that in the United States you know so <clears throat> that generation had reason to hope, I guess, I guess in the, in the United States, because we won a war. We did something we, uh, America thought was good, which was to stop Hitler. We did something good. And it made us feel proud to be an American. And of course we had uh, a much better attitude towards our government then at the end of World War II and people thought the world of it and never would think that anything crooked could come out of our government at least until Nixon. And that's right around the time when I showed up on this planet, is at that time where this country was at war with its government because Nixon was lying and doing all kinds of nasty shit that people didn't want to see, and we had this forever war going on in Vietnam, you know, um, and he, he was doing everything he could to stop it, even killing the innocent. Uh, it didn't make this country look very good. In fact, we, I think a lot of people were really disheartened by what was happening here. You know, they really were. And 
you know, to see your government doing those things like that, to people who are, you know, like my grandfather and stuff, seeing that had to be a horror in itself because they could not imagine our country being that bloody to do something in, in the name of our country. And uh, that's when attitudes begin to change in America for the worse. And it's steadily been declining ever since. So now what we have is a, a conundrum here, you know, of because we think the worst of things, the worst kinds of people become those empowered. And uh, I'll get back to that here after this commercial. cooking and eating real Cajun food long than my belly stomach is wide, and that's a fact. So when I told you you're going to like Cajun spice ruffles potato chips more better than them other Cajun potato chips, I'm not just whistling digs, you know. I'm singing you a Bayou Serenade. I guarantee. Mm -hmm. Only Cajun spice flavored ruffles brand potato chips have those spicy ruffles ridges, so the taste won't leave you flat. When the evening breeze whispers through the tree. Unusual, original, dynamically different. We love this. Great. We I've never seen anything like year. that before. This is great. Experience a night out of this world. See the man they call Rugby. Tonight through Saturday at the Centennial Concert Hall. You'll never forget. Tickets for tonight through Saturday at All Bass. Привет, чудак. Флаппи. Okay, everybody, welcome back. So, uh, as I was going to say before we went to the break, um, about politicians, you know, and how our public is in such a depressed state of, state of mind these days, um, that it does, I think it does influence the selection of our politicians in a way. Um, it seems to me, after all this time, that when America is suffering, uh, desperation sort of takes over, and people inadvertently, or whatever, tend to make the wrong choices. And when people make choices under strenuous conditions, they often make the wrong ones. And that's why when it comes to doing something important, like voting for your officials, you shouldn't go to the booths with anger, or revenge or you know anything like that on your mind okay because you're not going to select the right things it might make you feel good at the moment but in the long run uh, a lot of people are going to regret it and uh, I think we learned that from Trump but we the problem is is we got to remind people the last four years what it was like having to make that wrong choice and what it did to us as a nation it only further and depressed the country it further uh, shaped our, our feelings about our country, you know, and uh, if we can learn to do that, if we can learn to control, you know, our feelings and stuff when it comes to doing uh, important decisions and things, uh, a lot of mistakes can be avoided. I really believe that. And as far as what, uh, you know, Star Trek and, and, and uh, you know, why shows like that are getting so dark these days um, it's only because the audiences demand it um, which is why a lot of movies released today are dystopian uh, in basis okay 
uh, it's always depicting a world that's been devastated by something, you know, what you name it, whatever. And humanity is trying to struggle to rebuild itself. Now, in the same way, Gene Roddenberry was kind of doing the same thing, only we didn't get to see that <laughs> so much uh, when he was around. But it was always implied and said to, uh, in a narrative to the, to the viewer, that humanity uh, eventually did have World War III and the world was devastated with, you know, millions dead and humanity having to recover from it, okay? And so, in the process of recovering from it, uh, they learn to appreciate things better, you know? Um, and they learn, it's, you know, sort of like when, when a family loses their home to a fire, the feeling you have after that fire is over, knowing that your family got out, okay? Even though you lost everything, you have a stronger bond with your family. And I think that's what Roddenberry was trying to say, was that sometime in the future, the Earth is going to catch fire and the survivors of Earth are going to feel more bonded to each other because they survived it. And they're going to make sure that humanity doesn't make those same mistakes again because this time the lesson was learned the hard way and it costs so much. It costs so much of their 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 uh, uh, you know their world their, their cost so much of their society um, you know their civilization uh, that they want to get it back they didn't realize how good you know things could have been if they had just stopped what they were doing and so that's that's where this peacefulness comes in and this uh, uh, new level of thinking where people are care about each other and they don't they're not greedy and they're not selfish and that you know, they're more compassionate to each other because they had that great moment in the past that brought humanity together under a unifying reason, under a common denominator, and that was for survival, okay? And when you spend decades surviving, trying to rebuild what you lost, you know, it gets, it gets ingrained in you after a while, just like being negative about America is ingrained in us because of all the bad shit that's going on, okay? The same thing has to happen in reverse, only this time we have to be exposed to uh, positive things, you know, caring about each other, you know, and, and that. And that's that's how we learn from our mistakes. So something equally catastrophic doesn't have to be a nuclear war, it can be anything, you know, uh, uh, like I said, a near extinction level event, like an asteroid hitting the earth or something like that, or, or something big that damn near that makes mankind face its own mortality, all of mankind. <laughs> and having survived it somehow, you know, that's what would bring people together. That's what would stop the cycle of uh, dystopianism that's in, in, our, in our country. Um, because I don't think we're ever gonna have that so long as there's elements within us that are blinded by propaganda, blinded by party loyalty, blinded by um, not being able to see a jackass for what he is. As long as there's people among us that do that thing, the danger always exists that we're going to tread down this path again. Okay? So as long as we're still on that path now, and we're still doing those things now, uh, I don't see that, you know, things are really going to change as far as what we're doing to ourselves, entertainment-wise. TV shows are always going to be uh, the way they are now, and uh, you know, I just I feel like you know when we you know people are, are you know are talking about online about how Star Trek's gotten so dark and all that, and that goes right back to what I said originally. It's because audiences demand it. You know, um, if they don't give audiences what they want, they're afraid they're going to lose money. Uh, they don't have the balls to do what Gene Roddenberry did back in the in the 60s by saying, no, I'm not going to give them what they want. I'm going to give them what I want. I'm going to give them my vision of the future. And believe it or not, it took hold. <laughs> you know, in the, in the times when this country was falling apart, Star Trek became a, a phenomenon. You know, it did exactly the opposite of what people today would think would happen. And I don't think people today could really explain why that happened, why during the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement and the Women's uh, Lib, and all these things that were happening in our country, you know, our leadership being caught in one lie after another, why all of a sudden Star Trek, which was a positive influence in society, became so popular? 
when today everybody thinks it's the opposite that would make it popular again, to make it dark and sinister and, you know, uh, you know, shadows within shadows and plans within plans, you know what I'm saying? You know, all this fucking negative crap they put in it now. Um, and the reason why it feels like it's lost its way is because you have people running it now who don't believe in a, in a better tomorrow. The people making these shows now themselves are part of the problem that's, you know, infected our country. Um, it, 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 uh, they can't work on a show, and in other words, if it's too positive. It would just not suit them. They, they don't have the character to be able to do a TV show that's, that shows an enlightened future of humanity because they don't believe it. You know, imagine trying to do something you don't believe in and being forced to do it. After all, you're going to say, I quit. <laughs> you know, I just can't do this shit anymore. I quit. Well, that's what's going to happen, you know, if anybody ever forced these writers and all them to write something that really does look positive for about humanity, they're going to say, I quit. <laughs> they're not going to, they're not going to want to keep doing it. And uh, that's, what, that's what we're up against. And that's why... You know, in, in a lot of ways, that's one of the reasons why I can't really watch, you know, modern Star Trek today. And even though they say they're making a Star Trek now that's more closer to what Gene Roddenberry envisioned, uh, I'm skeptical. I really am. Because they're going to be using the same writers, right? Writers who've been writing about bad, negative stuff all the time. How can they possibly be tasked <laughs> to write about something positive? And if they do write something positive? Is it going to be corny like what they've done with Lower Decks? Is it going to look uh, funny and uh, ridiculous like childish in ways? Is that what they're going to consider a positive thing? Because if that's what they're going to do, then they've pretty much pissed all over canon and, and what, you know, uh, Roddenberry was trying to illustrate and then I won't watch that either. So, like I said, it's, it's really incumbent on uh, people like me, generation that I'm in, for them to come out and write for Star Trek because they the ones that are still linked to what Roddenberry wanted. They still have, they still know what has to be done. So, you know, and, and you know, that's pretty much, you know, all I wanted to really discuss here was that, um, which I know I've, I've discussed before in previous videos about things and pieces and stuff like that about why you know, I'm, I'm kind of really let down by uh, modern takes on Star Trek because it really isn't the same thing anymore. I mean, unfortunately, the younger generation doesn't see it because they didn't grow up with the same kind of Star Trek I grew up with, okay? You know, they didn't, they weren't, uh, they weren't uh, kind of uh, programmed, I guess, if you want to call it, in a way to look at Star Trek in, a, in, in the way Drew Roddenberry wanted it. Instead, they're being taught a whole new new song. And uh, so I think that it's uh, it's sad that it's come to that, but, you know, not entirely unexpected. So I'm going to end this uh, video here, and I want to tell everybody to uh, uh, keep wearing your mask, get vaccinated if you haven't, stay safe, stay healthy, wash your hands, watch your distancing. And I will talk to you again at another time, and I want everyone to take care, so I will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Yeah, you have the freedom to wear no mask. You can know something you're a schmuck for not wearing a mask.